Knock Knock High. Welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am your host, Dr. Glockenflecken. I am also your host, Lady Glockenflecken. Dr. Lady Glockenflecken. <laughs> Uh, and we are talking today to a hospitalist mm -hmm. and an author yes. named Dr. Ricardo Nuila. That's right. And he's also from Houston. Yes, uh, lots of Houstonians yeah, lately. Yeah, we've, uh, uh, we've done another uh, show with a Houstonian. Uh, and so it w maybe we should we just turn it into an all Houston um, podcast here? No, I think it... Probably not. Yeah, no, that, probably other people want to hear. Limit our mm -hmm. options here. So today is May. I mean, it's today is like an, a. It is in May. It is in May, but it's yeah, May. It is. And what is what is May to you? May. Do you enjoy May? Um, April showers, spring May flowers. It's very pretty. Yeah, here I like the flowers. May. There's a lot of flowers. There are. We're I feel gonna like Portland in spring is very similar to like October in Vermont. You know, it's like spring's answer to a New England fall. We're gonna have to. Start paying attention to our garden. Yeah. I say we as if I'm going to be doing any of that. Yeah. And that's the truth. I, you know what? You've you've come a long way in your ability to grow things. I have. Yes. I, I have had the blackest thumb for most of my life. I would kill even the easiest plants. But, you know, everybody had like a pandemic project. Like yeah. Some people were like baking sourdough and stuff. Well, for some reason, I mean, my first project was you had a cardiac arrest right at the beginning. And so that was like a, a, a big thing to deal with for a little while. But then once you were OK, it was like, what else can I keep alive? And so I just started gardening for some reason, like some sort of mental crisis in the middle of the pandemic. And I, I don't know, I'm sure there's something I could unpack in therapy underneath all of that. But uh, yeah, now I not now to, I can grow things. Not to diminish your progress as a gardener, but uh, we are in Oregon. It makes it much easier. It's true. It's like a cheat. Throw things outside, <laughs> and, and grow. it will grow. Right. And and you'll... temperate climate. It rains a lot. There's good. You know, <laughs> it's not that hard. But you've done great. You've really come a long way because you did kill a lot of things for a long time. Yes, I mean even house plants that are supposed to be super yeah, easy. So. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, you like, just, yeah, you just I, look at the plant funny and it would it would croak right on us yep so so yeah i have i have come a long way and now we have beautiful flowers every spring and that that's really nice i hope all of you have beautiful flowers this spring too but you know what else may is what may is mental health awareness month it is yes mental health awareness month and so this is a good month to uh check in on the people around you and yeah. especially in healthcare, you know, this is a um, burnout is such a huge problem uh, and it, it continues to be even before the pandemic and it's just gotten worse over the last few years. Uh, and so, you know, in the, the times in my life when I've felt burnout, when I've, I've just this, the stress of life has really gotten to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think talking to the people around you, you know, can really be helpful. Yeah, don't don't just keep it all to yourself. I don't think that ever helps anybody. <laughs> Whether it's, you know, a therapist, a, a family member, a loved one, whatever. Just, um, dog. you know, be there with each other. Your dog, if, if, if it helps, do it. And so, uh, yep, take care of each other. Take care of yourself. And let's... Yeah, um, and there's no shame in, in getting a little help with your mental health. I mean, you would take your car to the mechanic if it was needing yeah. an oil change or something, right? Like, it's just routine maintenance, but it's good for everybody. Yep, you don't have to you. be, you know, really struggling with something to take care of your mental health. And let's uh, let's talk about our guest today. All right. Should we? So we have uh, Dr. Ricardo Nuila, um, and he is a hospitalist at Bentob Hospital in Houston, also the director of the Humanities Expression and Arts Lab, HEAL, at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, which brings all the arts and humanities into medical education. And he's also the author of a fantastic book called The People's Hospital, Hope and Peril in American Medicine, which was released recently on March 14th. And so we're going to talk about that the book. We're going to talk about Ben Taub Hospital and we're going to talk about a, a lot about internal medicine. Um, yeah, it was a body medicine heavy episode. something you made, you made me you. do yep. later. Mm -hmm. So uh, kind of Dust uh, off your, yeah, your body medicine knowledge. I dusted my brain off a bit in this episode. <laughs> you're going to hear that. A little spring cleaning <laughs> in your head. All right, here we go. Here is Dr. Nuila. <laughs> 
All right, welcome. We have uh, Dr. Ricardo Nuila. Uh, sorry, I should have asked you that before we started. Is no, that... you got it. You nailed oh, it. I get it. Oh, Did I get it right? Look at there. <laughs> you know what? You know, it's I'm not even not... going to edit that out. I, I should have just no. gone with it and just, it just you know, you, trusted you, myself. You, you, you went with it, and, and it's it's <laughs> uncommon. People butcher it all the time. So, all congrats. right. Well, I, I feel pretty good about that. I mean, yeah, people butcher Glockenflecken all the time too, but that's that's a fake name that I mm. gave myself. Yeah. So well, they also butcher Flannery, believe it or not. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for being here. It's uh, it's really a pleasure. Oh no, uh, pleasure's mine. Thanks for uh, I mean, y'all do such wonderful work. And, and well, happy are you to be here? So, what are you, are you taking uh, time off from work to be doing this? Like, what 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 are you what would you normally be doing today if you weren't um, doing this? Right now, I'd be probably on a bike ride with my kids, which is why I feel kind of guilty oh, about. Oh no, about, that's about, way no, more no, important. No. I mean, I mean. <laughs> Normally, work-wise, I would probably either be on an off on week at the hospital, hospitalist work, probably getting out of work right now at this time, or I would be off and writing and yeah. figuring this stuff out, or you know, um, you know, just I have some other responsibilities at the medical school. Might be doing some of that. Can you so. can you go and just tell your kids that you're talking with a, a social media internet comedian ophthalmologist? I I can, and <laughs> and the thing is, is that my daughter would just get on YouTube, and I'm just like, you know, that that's like the, that's like what our parents kind of thought was, um, you know, I'm I'm coming to grips with what YouTube and 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 social media is. I mean, I even had in my mind, it's the filter that matters. You know, it's like how we yeah. teach our kids, but at the same time, it's still not not easy to to get through so i could tell Absolutely. my daughter's the type who would go to school and just be like to her teacher hey look my dad's on youtube <laughs> and it'd just be like i would be embarrassed so uh welcome I'm to gonna, my I, world yeah <laughs> i imagine one of our daughters has a t-shirt with six of his faces on it so <laughs> oh wow yeah, she wears... that's kind of cool though i mean it's better than the alternative right i mean I guess. it's i guess well, it's i'm not a, sure which so, is worse it's overall a positive thing so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah no but it's it, they understand they're kind of a little bit more plugged into social media than I would like for them to be. But we try to, I think the key is yeah. like keeping them safe on it. Right. And, and, yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. and that's it can be tricky, a learning process trying to figure that out. But, um, and being parents, you know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know. it sucks all the fun <laughs> Which out is of like everything. The hard, <laughs> can I just put, click a button that say just parent, like, you know, no. Right. Just, so, so what, um, uh, what, what med school is Ben Taub Hospital? Because we're going to talk a lot about Ben Taub Hospital yeah. today. So in, in Houston, Texas. And um, so what, 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 uh, I know there's multiple, there's a couple different med schools in mm -hmm. Houston. So does everybody rotate through Ben Taub? Do you pretty much see all the students at some point? Well, so uh, Baylor College of Medicine staffs Ben Taub Hospital. So it's only oh, okay. Baylor residents and Baylor, uh, staff there harris health so ben Taub is the flagship of the harris health system another hospital is uh lbj which is staffed by the university of texas or mcgovern houston and we also have in the mix uh, a new university university of houston medical school in oh. town which just started a couple which is an awesome place because they're founded with the principles of caring for a vulnerable community. So, oh, that's great. Um, so there's, there, but but at Ben Tob, you'll only see uh, Baylor Baylor docs. And Ben Tob, just to let everyone know, you know, give us a little background just about because Ben Tob is a very unique place. It's a unique hospital in a unique city. Uh, yeah. of Houston. And, you know, as someone, I, I grew up in Deer Park, Texas, you know, outside uh, okay. of Houston. So I'm very yeah. familiar. I honestly haven't, I didn't do any of my medical training or education in Houston. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I've ever actually been to Ben Taub, but I've, I, I've heard so many, you know, stories and things about it. So yeah, get, just, you know, give us a little insight into Ben Taub yeah. and how it relates to the community. Yeah, definitely. Um, I probably grew, I grew up like you having heard about Ben Taub, not really knowing what it was. I think if I reach right back into my memory and what I, what I remember is like, you know, something on the news, like uh cruise on the scene, victim taken to Ben Taub. Cause that's right. In, in essence, what it, it, what it started up off as, as a, um, or what we come to know it as, I would say prior to like you know, 10 years ago, as foremost a trauma center in a burn unit, something, it's one of the 
two level trauma centers for Houston, Texas. Now, I mean, the recommendations are that there is one, uh, a level one trauma center for every million people. And Houston has two of them right next to each other for a population of 6 million. And that's, that's the city planning that we have. That's not in ideal. Texas, right? <laughs> no, it's not ideal. Um, wow. But, but what I, I didn't, it took me a while to realize what the history is and mm -hmm. really what, what kind of work is done at Ben Top? So Ben Top, like I said, is the flagship of the Harris Health System, and this health system is a public healthcare system that's afforded by taxpayer money to provide healthcare for people who can't afford or access healthcare in the city. So people who it used to be that if you earned up to two hundred percent of uh, of uh, federal poverty level, you got you know your care provided for uh, by county tax dollars if you couldn't qualify for Medicaid or Medicare. Mm -hmm. And since it's connected to an academic healthcare unit like uh, Baylor College of Medicine, what that's done, and also University of Texas, it's created a, a robust network of primary care uh, clinics, specialty care, so that the care is not just purely patchwork. It's also, you know, specialized care, forward-thinking care, preventive care. And so this system has grown over the last years as the city has grown, and it reflects the diversity of what Houston is. Yeah. I think also, it's really interesting, the story by which the, this um, hospital district was founded. So in the 1960s, there was one hospital, one charity hospital that provided care to the people who couldn't afford it. Mostly, you know, immigrants or African Americans who, who had no access to healthcare. And the hospital that they had to go to to receive healthcare was Jefferson Davis Hospital. Yep. Obviously, like the name has a lot of bearing there. And uh, that charity hospital depended on the budget of the county and the city, who were always like at war with one another, trying to dump their share onto the other threatening in the papers like we're not gonna we're not gonna care we're not gonna right. up the 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 you know the budget for 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 jefferson davis and that became a war in 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 the newspapers well what happened was one of the most amazing people that i've ever read about this man named jan Hartog. this guy is a nazi a nazi resistance leader Dutch ship captain, guy who <laughs> captained ships into the Netherlands during the worst floods to rescue people. Also a playwright and a writer. I mean, wow. nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. I mean, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. He ends up in Houston, Texas to teach creative writing at the University of Houston. Oh, interesting. And since he is a Quaker, part of him is, I need to volunteer somewhere. And he comes to the faculty he hears these whisperings about this hospital, about the deplorable conditions. It's yeah. the, wit, the, the whisperings are that the kids, the newborns in the maternity ward are crying because there's just not enough milk to go around. The whisperings are that like a staph infection has roiled through the, the newborn ward and kids died. I mean, this is how much things have changed. You know? Wow. And so he goes to volunteer. And he sees these same conditions. He sees cockroach crawling on people's trachs. Oh, so geez. he decides to write about it. He writes a series of op-eds that are up here in the Houston Chronicle. And Houston at that time was the city of the future. It was the Astrodome was being built. And so it was oh, the yeah. first dome structure. Mm -hmm. It was also the space city. It was the home of NASA. I mean, we're talking in the middle of the Cold War. And so that it, Houston had a lot it's of prominence. Deal. Yeah. And so the business community internationally start to recognize, you know, what is this? What's going on? Houston uh, has all is the city of the future, but they can't take care of their poor, you know. And so, what this what this stimulates is is it becomes a civic issue. How are we going to get health care for the people who can't afford it? It becomes a, a referendum, a city referendum, to the uh, to the point where Houstonians vote on it. And they vote so that property taxes can be taken in the way that school boards take in mm -hmm. uh, property taxes so that people can have uh, access to health care. And over the, over the next decades, that's what grows into this system. And, it's, it's, and Texas has no state income tax, right? So it's no somewhat limited in where you could draw that money from. 
Right, exactly. And so that, I mean, that's the, the uh, you're, you're limited by state legislatures to provide health care. Mm-hmm. Now, this, Texas does have laws about caring for the indigent and they do make it the cap, they do designate it to the county. And different counties are differently uh, generous than others. Harris County, because of its growth, because of, I would say, you know, because of these academic centers has been uh, much more generous than the county surrounding it. And so that's one of the reasons why it's grown. And I, in, in reading your book, um, you know, one thing you touch on, which I, I, I found very interesting is we're, we're all concerned about healthcare spending and how yeah. expensive it is. And Ben Taub is so much lower kind of per capita spending. Yeah. And, and so you're in a, an environment that is, uh, you just don't have as many resources. You don't have as much money. You don't have much funding. Yet you're still able to provide really high quality care. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's great because you know it's a um, you know this idea that we need to be spending all this money that we need to have. You know, it's it just I love this story about Ben Tob because it's it just kind of th- throws everything in the face of that idea that it needs to be expensive. Yeah, you know, I, th- I think that that's kind of the genesis for this story. I mean, I went to, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I wrote this book, but one of them, uh, the part that you're describing, I remember going to a lecture here in town, a policy lecture given by one of the premier policy experts, Vivian Ho, who works at Rice University, talking about pricing. And uh, at the end, I said, I asked her, she's a friend now, but I asked her, what about, you know, comparing this to how much uh, the county system costs. And she said, there's no studies, you know, and it's, and it just mm. dawned on me. It's just like, we, we have a basic presumption in the United States that private healthcare, the way it's administered, it just has to be the way. And that's, and it's a cost. It, we have a, a major cost problem, but mm. we don't want to investigate any other ways beyond what this private system gives us. You know, if right. we're okay using public funds to pay for people's private health care. But we haven't even questioned, we haven't even studied the idea that, well, maybe public health care works. And I think that after years of work, I mean, it took me years to work in this system to kind of realize this is a public system. And um, actually, if you provide services directly, not through middlemen like insurance and everything, you can reduce the, you can lop off the costs, quite a bit of cost. And the question that everybody's going to ask you is quality. And, 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 and the question yeah. everybody's going to ask you is, well, you know, um, but that's just not going to be good. And, and that's where the experiences of us working in the hospital and some of the stats that came out was like, well, then what really is the reason why we're not looking at this health, at, at, at a public health care system? Right. The data is you know? not backing up that rhetoric. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what they're you know, that, that that's what they would always say. But I think that we need to have data. You know, I think yeah. we need to compare, we need to, to put that in there and, and, and think about this. Fortunately, there's probably a lot of uh, forces that are trying to avoid oh, yeah. mm-hmm. that kind of work from being done. Yeah. I, I mean, ex- I, I think that there are two, you know, mm-hmm. um, um, uh, I think that one of the books that's fundamental to me is, uh, you know, when I read it was Paul Starr's uh, Social Transformation of American Medicine. And you get, get a sense even when he's writing in the eighties of like how strong those forces are and they've only like multiplied, yeah. um, you know, what you talk about with private equity is, is even more of a robust kind of force that's, that's occurring right there, you know, but that's one of the reasons why it's so interesting to me that this was formed by referendum because to counterbalance that or one of the ways that we have to go against that force to weigh against that force, maybe it just might be public. It might be just democracy, you know, like how Mm -hmm. do maybe we can, maybe we can compete against these forces if we, if we have something public, you know, that's, that's my hope, you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to scrap hope together, you know, but I do take hope in where I work, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, just speaking of private equity, you know, (laughs) that, that is the big, if, if we could get like patient outcome data, you know, pre and post private equity acquisition, like that would be so telling. That would, not not even with an agenda, just to know, like just what know. is what is the result of of having all these private equity acquisitions. But yeah, there's no way we're gonna get that data. We're like, not gonna get that. It's, it's, it's gonna be yeah. You can't. Uh, it, it's just not in 
there's a lot of money and interest in avoiding that kind of thing. I do think it's interesting, though, that these, you know, this experience of Ben Top, this is happening in Texas, you know, one of the historically one of the most red states in the nation. And so it's I think that is just further proof. This does not have to be political. It doesn't have to be, you know, oh, all th- the things that get wrapped up in it. it doesn't have to be that way. I think you're so right about that. I feel like there's so much. Uh, first of all, I think that I mean, you probably feel this on a daily basis that like there's a lot of unity that we do not like our healthcare system. Right. And that right. goes beyond yeah. that, that's like let's that crosses the political spectrum. I just have right? to throw United Healthcare into a video and then and it's yeah. universally beloved. <laughs> yeah. So it's so in and I and I think that that's really telling, right? And it's something that we can again let's cling to that hope because it goes beyond party. We all agree that we want something different. Right. I mean, seven out of ten Texans in a survey say that they want the government, it's the government's responsibility to provide universal healthcare access. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, that's, that's incredible. That's, that's like, that's something that's that constant. That is a surprising the number. Yeah. That's, you know? And so, yeah. but the problem, I think one of the problems that we have is, is that like once the, our political system, once these ideas come to the, par, uh, to the level of party and candidate, they start to disintegrate. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. that's why, I mean, that's why I wrote that we should have an, a referendum, you know, uh, like we sure. should have like a, uh, it's some, I know it's never been done. I'm not trying to be nice. I'm, I know how difficult that would be. Right. But, um, I challenge people to tell me like, would you vote for a new healthcare system? We, we don't have to have a plan before we could just have a referendum. Do we need a, yeah. a, a universal? And then that sends a, if we say, have a majority yes, that sends like a message to Congress, build us one, you know, in this term, you know, we can start electing people who are behind the referendum. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to be, we have to be creative with our democracy in order to, to, start to combat these, to combat these forces, which are extremely strong, you know? And you've been at Ben, ben Top for how, how many years now? Well, I'm totally inbred there. I mean, I am like, I was like a med student. Born I, and raised. Were you born and you know, in the- Oh, I was, I, I was, I came to Houston in second grade and I've stayed and I was one of those people who was just like, I'm, I'm getting out of Dodge, like the first chance I get. <laughs> but uh, I did go away for college, but the, yeah. the, the pull to medical school is like so strong to stay in Texas. You yeah. Know? I mean, it's and, a, the, uh, the Texas Medical Center, like you'd be hard pressed to find a better place to learn how to be a doctor. I, you know, I think that's one thing that the Texas legislature does really well. They uh, subsidize medical education so that like I paid $6,500 a year Ooh. for tuition to go to Baylor. You know, that's. You hear that? You're welcome. <laughs> manageable. She, I was, you know, I was, I was going <laughs> to go to Texas for med school and then yeah. and Kristen was like, no, no, no. We're going to we're going to Dartmouth. I said that's where I was going. You yeah, made your that, own decision. That's true. I, I well, you I know, like you. My, <laughs> love love Trump's money. You know, so uh, <laughs> it but worked out well for him. It, it's uh, but yeah, you can't beat that uh, that, no, that in state Texas tuition. Yeah, <laughs> you can't beat it. And so I was like, my whole you know idea of like leaving the state, moving to New York or San Francisco or wherever I was that I was thinking at that time. It just um. I'm going to go back to Houston. I was also struggling at the time with whether I was going to write or, mm-hmm. or become a doctor. And um, I j- it just seemed right to me to come to to Houston. And so I stayed as a student, as a resident. I stayed because of Ben Top. I, yeah. I love the healthcare. I love being able to work the way that I want to work as a doctor over there. And um, I just love that I'm not worried about reimbursements. I'm paid a salary and I can focus on medicine. Mm-hmm. Do you find yeah, that I've that helps there. the doctor patient relationship? Do you think? For I mean, me, I know you have maybe just that experience to draw from, but for me, it certainly has. And I yeah. think a lot of my colleagues, you know, they like, they think that they can speak with patients on on a level where it's just not about that financial incentive, like lurking over your shoulder, right. and you have to have that other, you know, like uh, angel on your other shoulder to say hey, it's okay, you know. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's been liberating. That's yeah. all I'll say. I mean, it's just been like, I just go and do my job now. I mean, I, I like that the system that I work in, you know, pays me a, a good salary, like market. I'm not, you know, we're not, working I'm not for subsidizing free. my yeah. own. I'm not working for right. free and I'm not subsidizing my own. We, 
right. you go by market, but it's just that there's not these robust bonuses that I feel like is in and, and like little things. Like I work, I have a cap of patients, you know, mm -hmm. as a hospitalist, you know, we get to 15 and it's just like, I can't take any more admission. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's a reason for that so that we can provide quality to each of those patients. And we feel it mm -hmm. when it's at 14, you know, and right. everything. Sure. So it's, um, but, but you hear the stories of people who are working, admitting 25 patients in a night or who have like uh, 22 patients. And it's just like, I, that's why I feel liberated, you know, to yeah. be able to, uh, you know, to practice medicine the way I want to in, in that system. What must it have been like to, cause in, in your book, you, you know, lots of stories about, you know, different patients and just the, you know, when you're going through med school, you hear all the, you learn about all the, the regular things, the typical things, the horses. All right. But then yeah. you talk a bit about just the unbelievable breadth of things, like yeah. everything you actually learn about in med school, you're going to see you know, yeah. in, in that kind of environment. And so, uh, yeah, speak to a little bit about, about that. If you would. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll say this. I, I, one of the reasons I fell in love with medicine, I was struggling between like whether I was going to stay in medicine or if I was going to leave and do something and, and become a writer, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I fell in love with morning report event talk, which uh -huh. was the story <laughs> of diagnosis, the story of people's, you know, um, of these illnesses, you know, oh, yeah. described. And I, I just, I would, I would even come on my off time to like, kind of, uh, when I wasn't on a uh, medical rotation to listen to those stories because they were just, I was just like, wow, I, you know, tuberculosis of like the peritoneum, um, amyloidosis. I mean, those are, those are some of like the, the ones that we see more often, you know, but it's just, like have you, you ever see seen them. tuberculosis of the eyeball? <laughs> I have seen it, but I have, oh, but I have, because I, I haven't. You haven't, you haven't seen it. Because <laughs> I haven't, no. Yeah, I, I mean, we've diagnosed people with tuberculosis yeah. of like the, uh, like, I think it was UVI. You have to freaking be, but I know no, that no, we, no, that's right. we had yeah, ophthalmology. Yeah. We had to have ophthalmology. I mean, you can tell in the enthusiasm of the residents and of the staff why they're there, you know, when they get yeah. this, these diagnoses. And, and that's one of the most beautiful things about where I work, you know, yeah. is that, um, you will see so much medicine there. And that's one of the reasons I fell in love. And, 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 I, and I mean, I don't know if I would be in medicine yeah. were it not for Ben Top. If I was at a, I mean, I don't want to speak ill of anything because I think there's a lot of beauty in, even in like the, you know, the, the heart failures and all that stuff, but it, it's stuff that is like, has to be learned so many rather than it's just so vivid, you know, mm -hmm. the mosaic that you find, you know, I do remember those morning reports and med school they were always so fun especially when you're training you know because oh, uh, yeah so it, it, just for people that d don't have no idea what a morning report is <laughs> uh, you know it's it's usually you know people different members of the healthcare team anywhere you know from students to residents to attendings and specialists and whoever whoever's around and you just come in and usually somebody presents a case right there's right. something uh and a lot of times it's it's kind of like an episode of of house in some ways, house MD, right? Cause you got the whiteboard right. up there. You're kind of throwing out suggestions. Like, what do you think it is now? And then you give a little bit more information you're like, Oh, what, what could this be now? It's just very, it's a, it's kind of an exciting, and I know this sounds very nerdy, but it's, it is a very exciting <laughs> kind of fact finding mission. And, uh, and learning opportunity. You'll learn a lot. It's like doing a, it's that. like a detective. Novel. It's like kind of like a yeah. detective. <laughs> uh, yeah. You're a detective trying to figure it out. And when, and when I was training, um, it was like also like right at that, like kind of cusp of like old school meeting new school, you know, where it was just like, you had the old school attendings who like just bled for all this stuff and it would be arguments and things. I mean, I feel like that happens less now, you know, but it's, it's a um, shame because that's where I get a lot of my content. That's <laughs> too bad. I, I know. If you're listening, please argue with each other. I, I want to hear argue. about but it. But do it online so he can see <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take it online. I need, I need some more. I've already addressed the cardiology nephrology battles. I need, I need a little bit more. But uh. I mean, there were there was crazy stuff back in the day. I mean, there were like literal, like kind of like uh, 
fist fights and stuff like that oh over goodness. this stuff. You know, did that kind was... of thing happen in rounds as well? <laughs> I, you know, I, I've heard of people taking each other up against a wall because of like just, <laughs> oh I mean, God. I mean, th and yeah. now this didn't happen right when it happened like five years or so before I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a different, it um, gets different passionate. world. Yeah. It's passionate. passionate. That's, yeah. <laughs> but that's the passion that people had toward like these diagnoses. Yeah. And I think some of it had to do with, you know, um, we didn't, we didn't have Google at our fingertips and we couldn't figure that out. And so it was just like people's memory were on display. Mm -hmm. Now it's a lot about filtering and like figuring out, you know, like, you know, just, I don't know, like how to implement those diagnoses in, right. in patients, you know? So. Well, I want to make sure that, um, you know, because you've, you've been working in this, in such a, this unique environment, I'm sure you could just probably tell us stories forever. But I did, I did ask you if, if you could you know, bring a couple of stories from your life as an attending uh, yeah. physician at, at Ben Taub. Would you care to share uh, one of yeah. those experiences? Sure, sure. Well, I can, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell one of them that is kind of an embarrassing uh, story first. And it was oh, perfect. I, <laughs> I was, um, I was an attending who I still am an attending who focuses on bedside rounds. And I tell the team, you know, we're going to present at the bed at bedside as like default, but you all tell me if there's a reason not to, and there are compelling reasons not to, but we, you know, because of the nature we, of, of how we admit one day we got like, we got eight admissions and I was taking, and I was, you know, going through them all like at the bedside and, the, as, as we're getting toward the last one, you know, the, the resident had already told me, you know, oh, this person's probably going to go. So uh, I was like, okay, you know, and as we were, we were just in a hurry to get everybody moving and going. And as I get to the, to the last uh, patient, she's like, oh, I think we should, we're walking into the exam room where she's, where, where, where she's like, I think we should talk about this briefly. And I was like, that's okay. We've had such a good moving uh, uh, morning. That's okay. So we get to the bedside. And we're all around this patient. He looks really, really comfortable. He looks normal, breathing normally, young person. Doesn't look like the mm -hmm. person belongs in the hospital. So immediately in my mind, because I'm just, you know, trying to foresee the future, even though I'm not, I'm, I'm impatient to like, kind right. of, I'm like, this guy's fine, you know? But, um, and, and she's already told me he's going to be discharged, you know? So. I'm listening and they start telling the story about how he had no past medical history and how he was at his fraternity house and uh -oh. how he was helping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and how he was helping them move boxes, like helping somebody move into the house where they decided that it was going to be kind of funny to make him, to, to give him some brownies with some pot in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, good for him. He had, he got a little high and like, I don't know why the ER admitted him. Yeah. <laughs> but like, whatever, he's recovered. They just probably wanted to watch him. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of like, I'm saying stuff kind of like, all right, I, I get, I get, yeah. I, I get the story, you know? And, and, and I'm like, well, so he looks like, he looks good right now. And she's like, yeah, but he. So he had the, the, the brownies, unbeknownst to him, he sits down, he's a little bit dizzy. And I'm like, yeah, but he's doing fine. He's doing fine, like in front of him. And, and then she's like, then he's, he becomes unresponsive and uh, he oh. loses a pulse. Oh my and they start gosh. Doing, and I'm just like, oh, this, I just, that took I know a turn. It, takes a, it takes a total <laughs> turn. And they, you know, first respondents come and they intubate him on the field. And I start, and I literally break down laughing there right in front of him. <laughs> It's like and this I'm is a weed. Well, I mean, it's a, yeah. Well, I'm just yeah, like, what was I in was those just brownies? like, it was just because I was just like, we. I was like, what, what, what happened? Yeah. But I, part of it was because I was just seeing him right there, and he was doing fine. Right. And part of it was just because it was just it had like the whole narrative had been spun in my head in a certain way. Yeah. And and I was also thinking like those bastard friends of his, you right. know, what I mean? like, yeah, who gave him like this thing, and like they're I, I'm putting myself in. So I just kind of like lost it and I started laughing and, and I, and I, I had to like leave the room and I had to come back and say, listen, I am, that was so unprofessional of me. I'm so sorry. I'm really happy. You're, I just really kind of. Yeah. Took you by surprise. Was, it took me by surprise. It yeah. just, it just rolled, you know, so I, I still feel 
uh, you know, feel bad about it, but it was just one of those things oh where it's just like, when your mind is working in oh, one yeah. way, you know, no. it's just like you foresee it. And then it's just like, I've, I've been in situations like the inappropriate laughter thing it, it, because it's, yeah. it's just kind of like a, like a, it's almost like, a reflex, it's like a nervous oh, yeah. Yeah. response to something. Do they know what right. happened to the, yeah, to the what patient? Did he, like, what, what did happened? he actually, you know, the, the, the UDS didn't show anything but marijuana. Um, you know, I, you know, he, he got into it. He was quickly, yeah. Uh, you know, extubated. And I mean, they sent him to us basically just to watch for a few hours because yeah. he, w I mean, and, and we discharged him because his vitals were completely fine and everything. So as another, it was, as a fellow young person who's, yeah. whose heart stopped, right. I, get, I get interested in these types of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. Well, yeah. Yeah. It makes oh, sense. And interesting. it's, 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 I don't, I don't know if they had, if, if, if they didn't find that the yeah. brownies had anything else in it but it so was, is that's it why possible it, that he just like randomly had an idiopathic cardiac arrest at the same time that they gave him these brownies oh man, <laughs> like i, I mean i want just... i wonder if if it's like he's one of those very rare people who had like who got so i mean who knows how much they put right. into the brownies but yeah. he just just had a he reaction just had, like he's well maybe there is like a very very few amount of people who have a response like that and he was one of the well, you know? marijuana is one of those things like there's the cyclic vomiting syndrome yeah that you oh. can yeah. like when you have a when you get really high i, I think it's a thing no, that's right a good point you know maybe he maybe he vases a vagal or yeah. something like that 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 something happened strange oh yeah something, oh, man. something very strange and i think that's one of the reasons why they were like that we wanted we wanted yeah, to just um, keep him here and see observe what happens. <laughs> him a little bit because that was very strange but... i'm sure yeah. he was probably he probably accepted your apology i'm sure he was just fine <laughs> oh he just wanted to go home <laughs> he's, he, like, yeah. he's, he's like get me out of the hospital <laughs> he accepted my apologies just like he, he was just like i i understand you know yeah. Way, but, you know, but yeah <laughs> well let's take a quick break and then uh, we'll be right back with uh dr ricardo Nila. Kristen, you know that as an ophthalmologist, I don't tend to get excited about stethoscopes. I do know that, yes. But I have around my neck the Echo Health's 3M Lipman Core Digital Stethoscope. This thing is incredible. It's got active background noise cancellation up to 40 times amplification. That's pretty impressive. It, I could practically hear the individual myocytes talking to each other. And I have one too, and mine is rainbow. Yours is much cooler than mine. I know. I might just wear it around the house with the it's noise cancellation, so I don't have to hear you and the kids. That's fair. You know, this thing would be perfect gift for anybody in healthcare. What? So, we have a special offer for our U.S. audience. Visit echohealth.com slash KKH and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's digital stethoscope technology. That's E-K-O health slash KKH and use NOC50 to get $50 off plus a free case plus free engraving with our exclusive offer. All right, we are back with Dr. Ricardo Nuila and we are going to be playing a little game. I don't have a good name for this. Um, I didn't really do all the planning Body for it. Body medicine versus we'll say, ophthalmology. Yeah, something like that. So sure. basically, it's kind of like a medical trivia game. But in the past, I've like put my guests on the spot and made them answer ophthalmology questions. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to do that yeah. to you, but, but <laughs> I'm going to take the pain as well. And so what okay. we did was we asked ChatGPT... Uh, to oh, come wow. up with a list of what did you say? What was the prompt? Uh, well, just you know, medical trivia. Medical trivia that, questions. No, that a hospitalist should know. Oh uh, man! And so he will is going to answer those questions, and you will be presented with medical trivia that an ophthalmologist should know. And we're gonna see I who pass, can get the get most board right. Certified? Yeah, yeah, I, I get think board that's certified. how that works. Yes. Okay. Good. That's exactly totally. how it works. You'll be <laughs> double board certified. You'll be the first person nice. in history. Yes. Double <laughs> certified in internal medicine and ophthalmology. I, I have a YouTube to <laughs> prove that I am board certified in ophthalmology. <laughs> so, I, so we'll take turns, and we'll uh, just yes. we'll just go until until one of us embarrasses ourselves enough that we have to stop. Yeah. So awesome. I have a list of ten each here, but I'm not uh, going to do go all first. ten. We're gonna we're give, gonna give me see. something first. I'm I'm yeah. excited. I, I I haven't I haven't thought about internal medicine in a while. Okay. So let's see what I let's see how how I do here. And I haven't by the way I have not seen any of these. Right. 
I, so I, I don't know what she's going to ask, if it's going to even make sense coming from an AI generated program. <laughs> we'll find program. out because we'll, I can't we'll tell out. either. <laughs> awesome. All right. Love it. Okay. I'm, Love I it. think this might be a softball. So I'll throw okay. you a softball to start okay. with. Okay. Will, what is the purpose of a hospitalist program? Like, what is it that a hospitalist does? I'll answer that. Yeah. Okay. Essentially. Yeah. A hospitalist is a general internal medicine doctor who uh, admits patients to the hospital <laughs> and treats them slash coordinates all the care for that patient during their hospitalization. Okay, Dr. Damila, how did he do? I, right? I, I think that's pretty good. I struggle with everybody <laughs> asks me what a hospitalist does and I'm like well you see you know the thing is with hospital medicine you know like they specialize in hospitals that's yeah, 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 yeah. You, see, you can't have a hospitalist without a hospital but you know no I think you did Chad I think you GPT did really well. says the purpose of a hospitalist program is to provide specialized medical care to patients who are hospitalized so it says go. pretty okay. much the All same right. thing great <laughs> wonderful <laughs> perfect okay so over to you Dr. Nuila what is the purpose of the retina in the eye? Well, the retina is the, I mean, it's, it's basically the brain and it takes the photons and changes them into electrical signals that can be interpreted by different parts of the brain. That is very good. That is correct. Yes. It says the yes. retina is responsible for detecting light and transmitting visual information to the brain. Perfect. There you go. That was really good. Word I'm word just about. Yeah. You did much better than he did on that know, first question. Okay. And yours right. was harder. I, I did pretty good. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's give did, me credit. I, All right. He was there just were, faster and more, more eloquent. He was, he was more confident. All right. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's, let's um, have it. I'm trying. I'm not looking at the paper, so I don't know. Some of these are like, I can't ask you that because you already know from your personal health history. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't give me something I'll know. Yeah. Give me okay. something that I All right. think I'll uh, what is sepsis and what are some common signs and symptoms? Oh my God. Back okay. to med school. What is sepsis? Yes. Uh, start there. Sepsis is when you have an in infection that, uh, that causes failure of, of like several organ systems, um, I'm going to go with that. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, there's like, I know that there's like sepsis criteria because I've like, yeah. I've made fun of that in my videos oh, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because every, no one like, it's like a big like thing with like where you admit the patient and do they, do they like qualify for under sepsis protocol? Mm. Okay. Um, so what are, what are some common signs and symptoms? What are some common signs? Okay. Like, like a vital sign problem so l like hypotension low blood pressure um uh fever over a certain amount high uh white blood cell count no um, that's good that sounds a yeah uh and you know then the like the organs stuff. will stop working so uh, you know stuff. your creatinine will your kidneys will start failing and <laughs> you just start losing blood flow to things and they shut down all right. What do you think? Is that is that I think correct pretty answer? Good. I think that's very good. And you know what? If you asked me sepsis criteria, I would probably not get it because of all, because <laughs> of like all, all, but no, it's, that sounds pretty good. Like, I mean, sometimes it, it, it well, most of the time it's triggered by infection, but it, it's an inflammatory response oh, a lot of times. Okay. And, inflammatory. But I, this, uh, this whole, this process is scratching my brain in a particular way that ha hasn't it's been scratched him quite in a while. uncomfortable. All right, let's go. Okay. Let's do the. All right, Dr. Nuila, mm -hmm. um, let me pick one here, I'll give you, okay, what is a cataract and how is it treated? Cataract is on the cornea, it's basically scarring of the cornea and it's treated by excision. Mm, no, oh. not quite. Hey. <laughs> That's Okay. <laughs> The, it's it's the That's lens. Bad. It's the lens. Oh, the lens, inside lens, the lens, eye. lens, 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 lens. No, no, I you, knew, you knew, I knew that. You knew yeah, it. Yeah, the rest it. was correct. It's, it's one little it's word. It's layers of the it's eye. It's basically layers. Right. The cornea is that that front layer, right? And the lens is inside the eye. But yes, you, you, 
you do extract it. You know, usually, usually if that would come up on rounds, I would just look at my resident, <laughs> just be like, well, what, what is a cat? Or let's all, let's think? all think about that. You know, but now it's like my lack of knowledge is on, ex I will forget it now. I will tell you, there's in no way should you ever like be talking about cataracts during like internal medicine <laughs> rounds. That that should that's like uh, on the list of problems. That's very far down the line. Yeah. So don't worry about it. N not urgent. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what is the purpose of a Foley catheter, and how oh. is it inserted? Uh, well, a Foley catheter is. The purpose of it is whenever someone cannot urinate and you need to decompress their bladder and it might be an extended period of time before they are either conscious or able to, they can be awake, but they're able to pee on their own. So you put the catheter, which is a little tube, through the urethra into the bladder. That was an easy one. I'm sorry I asked. Um, that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Give me something harder. Come on. Uh, that's, that was well, no, too it's much. It's not your turn. It's not your okay, turn. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. I don't I'm, even I'm know what some of these are. I'm trying doctor. not to give you any that are too hard, but like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. What is macular degeneration and what are some common risk factors? Ooh. Macular degeneration is. A little harder one. It is. It's. Parts of the retina start. It's not. Is it, it yeah. parts of the retina start to the pigment in the in in the retina starts to degenerate for different yeah. reasons. But you start to see you start to have blindness in in certain areas of your uh, areas of your vision. Yeah, your 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 retina atrophies. Atrophies. And so yeah. yeah, you end up with this kind of depigmented look uh, to the retina because you. It's called, it's just total atrophy. And so you're losing the photoreceptors. Yeah. And, and it does that, 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 obviously that part of the retina is not working anymore. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's, you have and a you big blind spot. And you lose vision in the center. Yep, the it is. That's right in the so macula. So you have like donut vision. And yeah, the, the hole, the donut hole being yeah, the, in the center. loss of the vision. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's. <laughs> Uh, there well, you go, folks. Donut vision is uh, no. macular degeneration. <laughs> probably the, it, it kind of makes sense. Okay. <laughs> okay, but wait, common risk factors oh, for oh, macular I degeneration. I would not expect, I would be very impressed if anybody well, is, else. Isn't some of it genetic? Yes. yes. Or isn't, Absolutely. Is, and I mean, age is age? probably. Look at is, him go. Is, Those are and... two of the two biggest ones. Absolutely. Okay. That's uh, that's, it's, Chat I'm going to leave it like that. But... Yeah, just quit while you're <laughs> yeah. ahead. Yeah, that's good. Chat GPT also includes smoking. Yep, smoking. We always tell people, make sure they're not smoking. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Let's Ooh, do a couple okay. more. Okay, all right, Will. What is a, oh boy, what is a pneumothorax and what are some common causes? I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. No, you did it. Yeah. Um, okay, a pneumothorax is where... Uh, the part of the lung has collapsed because air has escaped from the lung or from the outside air and is occupying the space between the lung and the pl pleura, which is like the little like the case of the lung, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the little, like a little, uh, like, uh, like, you know, you have like a sausage casing. Oh, okay. Like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way. <laughs> Might it be considered the chest wall? Oh, the, oh, the chest. Yes. Yeah. The chest wall. There you go. That's good. And the, the causes, Common causes, I mean, trauma, um, spontaneous. I think I, that's a thing. Yeah. I think you can have no, one just spontaneous. spontaneously hey, that's... and, and like. I don't know, cancer. There's like probably a lot of things that could cause a pneumothorax. That's your, that's your medical professional opinion. <laughs> that's a, lot a lot of, of stuff. Things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably a lot of stuff. It's probably just, How you did know. he do, Dr. Nuila? What are some common causes? Well, COPD, you can have plebs that once they, uh, once the, 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 they break like the, um, I'm, I'm losing the word, but. You know the uh, the sacks break, and so like air can go through. Oh, gotcha. Through that, you know, but um, also, yeah, trauma is is one of the major major ones. Also. All right. 
go. Okay. I nailed it. So ish. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, I don't sound confident though. No. I, I'm like I'm I'm really like a beginning like third year med student. Like, yeah, trying you have to explain forgotten some of these things, but not being real sure about it, right. and and being you afraid I'm going to get it wrong. You can tell it was in there one wrong. time, yeah. but it was that there. it's a little fuzzy. I got now. the words. No, but you, but you, you, you can fish it out well, though. You're fishing <laughs> it, it out well. You're like, it's like you're, fight, you're like old man in the sea, just <laughs> really right. like, just gonna be fishing it out there. It bites you on the way out, but you get it eventually. <laughs> All right, let's give him one more. All right, one more. What is amblyopia and how is it treated? Oh, oh am, I'm amblyopia. so sorry. That's that's amblyopia because I think, think about think the, back the to roots. Latin. Yeah, am it's amblyopia is um, we see double no, no that's I'm, diplopia. That's diplopia. And this this is like the no, I, let him have a chance. Okay, no, Am I, I feel bad because like <laughs> give like, me a hint. Give me okay. a hint. Okay, yeah. Do you want to give a hint? Or should I, the ophthalmologist? Uh, you give you should probably give a hint. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's related to when an eye doesn't want to work real well. So it's like it's not sinking. Like the eye is like basically, it should be together on one thing, but 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 because of a of a of a nerve palsy, you know, That's like one with reason. the movement, it's 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 not sinking. So. You can get well. That could be a cause for double vision, right? It or can be, but you're talking about strabismus in particular, okay. where the, the eyes aren't working together. I but see. But then strabismus can lead to amblyopia because amblyopia is when your brain usually it happens at a very early age, like as a kid. So see, this isn't fair because he's he's okay, a okay. he's an adult medicine doctor. I know. Well, see, gonna, I don't know which ones are hard or not hard. Nobody knows anything about amblyopia. <laughs> so it's where your brain us. doesn't develop the normal vision out of an eye. Oh, uh, okay. And so, you know, that's it's you're like going a, good a little thing. deeper than Chat GPT here. <laughs> Come on, Chat GPT. Okay. Get it together. You should have asked him about I see that. You should have asked him about presbyopia. He could probably get presbyopia. Well, okay. Amblyopia, also known as lazy eye. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is a condition in which one eye is weaker than the other, causing poor vision. It can be treated with eyeglasses, eye patches, or vision therapy. Ah, uh, yeah. Got it. All right. Well, okay. We'll... I got to get last oh, do question I get, I get one for more? you. Okay, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Because now I have to give you a really hard one. But again, I have How no way to evaluate. How are you going to know? You, gonna know? <laughs> you have not heard any of these words. I have two. <laughs> okay. Um,. Some of these I do know will be too easy for you, so I'm, I'm trying to skip over those. Yeah. So I think the only one I, I have available to me right now is, what is a DVT and what are some common risk factors? Oh, no, it's too easy, isn't I it? I got it. Okay. Deep vein thrombosis. That's it. Boom. Boom. It's a thrombus in the deep veins. <laughs> and that is? It's a, like a blood clot. You get in your legs, and it can go other places where you don't want it. Okay. Risk factors? Uh, like blood clotting disorders, <laughs> where you you just you that know seems like clot the blood cheating. too much. Like yeah. you know, that's uh, the classic one. That the board exam question mm. would be like uh, a young woman on uh, birth control who's smoking mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and develops blood clots that okay. that go places to give yeah. you like a embolism and stuff. All right, I'm tired. Let's. I don't want to. No, do no, we any have more to do one more. Medical. We have to do one more, but it's going to be an improv one, oh, Doctor no. Nuila. Just to even things out, because I feel bad. Toss him your hardest body oh. medicine oh, question, God. and My let's hardest see what he body can do. Medicine question. Yep. Oh gosh. As far away from the nasal bridge as you can manage. Oh man. Um, <laughs> what is? <laughs> let's see. Um. I have to think about what was a question you gave one of your trainees? Yeah, like a board question or on rounds. Step one. Okay. <laughs> um, what? What is the? Uh, what don't you see? What? What feature do you not see on an EKG that you normally see on an EKG in atrial fibrillation? What? part yeah. of the whole oh. Q QRS yeah, yeah. Yeah. complex. Yeah, yeah. The uh um yeah, you don't uh you don't see P waves. There you go. Hey. Nice. Love it. 
look at that look. Well that done. He's giving I'm me. so proud of myself. <laughs> yeah, there so you go. Smug. You as, deserve it. As, as you know, as yeah, I think, uh, I think both of us are board certified in each other's specialties. I think now. so. So uh, yeah. somebody alert the boards <laughs> that we may be practicing outside of our license. But you would have to license. go into a hospital to do his. <laughs> That's job. true. We won't do that. All right, that was great. Thank. You. Let's let's take a, another quick break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> All right, we are back. Let's take a look at some of our favorite medical stories sent in by you, the listeners. We also have uh, Dr. Nuila here, who is going to uh, you know, react to these with us. So we have uh, a story from Anastasia. Anastasia says, I work at a wolf rescue, and it was vet day. Wolf. We see a lady, a wolf rescue. That's right, which I wasn't aware. that. I mean, I assume there's got to be a rescue for probably every animal on Earth. But uh, we see a lady in scrubs arrive and assume... That's her. We go up to her under the assumption this is a vet. This is a veterinarian. And ask, do you have a muzzle with you? She says no, and we keep chatting. I feel like the muzzle is an important piece of, of wolf rescue life. Then, she's, then she asks, oh, are, are, are these all wolves? Odd, but you know, maybe a miscommunication with whoever told her she was coming. After a minute, we realize that she is a traveling nurse for an elderly patient who lives on the site. Oh. <laughs> oh my and gosh. we just casually walked up to a human nurse and asked if she, <laughs> she had, a, had muzzle, a muzzle. And she just went with it. <laughs> I can't imagine what was going through her head, but we all had a good laugh about it. Oh, no. <laughs> that is funny. I'll just... Well, you see all hey. kinds of things in healthcare. So yeah. I guess you... it doesn't phase you if you're asked for a muzzle. People these days. You know? People <laughs> That's these days. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, uh, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, send us your stories, knock knock high at human content.com. Uh, Dr. Nuila, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Let us people know where they can find you. Tell us about your book. We want to hear about that. Yeah. So the book is The People's Hospital Hope and Peril in American Medicine. Uh, it's, it's about five Houstonians who can't access health care for all the routine Texas reasons. They're either underinsured, uninsured, or they've been kicked off of Medicaid. And they're struggling to find their, uh, you know, they're struggling to find care. And they make their way to the public health care system where I work, Ben Taub. And their stories are woven in with a history of how private health insurance became the point of entry into American healthcare, with how hospitals became for profit versus non profit versus, um, you know, what are public hospitals. Also, with the history of how, how fee for service uh, took off in the United States. And it's all my, you know, my way of arguing that. Public health care can be something that we can be proud of in the United States. It can be something that can address both of these big problems that we have. We want universal health care access, but we also want to control costs. So we have to think about other ways to do that. And I think that public health care is actually one of the ways. And, and I take my, the, the system where I've worked as an example of how it can succeed in, in, um, in, in the United States. It's a fantastic Super book. Interesting. And uh, so I definitely encourage everyone uh, to check it out. Lots of good stuff in there. So thank you so much again for being here. Uh, and where can pleasure. people find you? If they want to hear more. They can more. find me on my, uh, I have my website, ricardonuila.com. Um, the book is available anywhere where you can find books. Uh, it's published by Scribner and you can find it on Amazon, Indie Books, Barnes and Noble. And, uh, I, I just, you can also look me up. I just had an op-ed in the New York times and, and there's a segment of this book that's on the New Yorkers website. Um, just, just Google me. Awesome. You'll find me. Right. Great. Well, good luck to you. Thank you Thank for you joining so much. us. Hey, and I appreciate all of what y'all are doing. Y'all are wonderful. Oh, I appreciate oh, thanks. it. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, that was a great conversation. Yeah, he's got some super interesting work that he's doing. That Ben Taub Hospital, like honestly, that book, the is what an interesting, uh, just a fascinating place to work. I was wondering like how many hospitals are like are that like, out yeah. there because they're, you know, the safety net hospital. I'm sure for every major city and metro area probably has one, but right. uh, maybe I mean Houston is just a massive, massive place, and so uh, I don't know. It'd be a 
I'd love to hear uh, stories from other similar types of hospitals and uh, right. how they, with the similarities. Yeah, between them. if any of you listeners work at a hospital yeah. like that, let us know and share some You're, stories I'm, if you can. And... Absolutely. You're sitting on a gold mine of <laughs> stories <laughs> That's at, right. at, at all these uh, uh, say public uh, safety and safety net hospitals. So uh, thank you also for sending in your stories. Uh, we love reading those on the show. Uh, so please you know, let us know. Hit us up. There's lots of ways to reach out. You can email us, knockknockhigh at human-content.com. Uh, we're all over social media. Uh, we're on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, YouTube. And uh, you also hang out with us and our human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Thanks to all the listeners who are leaving wonderful feedback and reviews. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out like today. ISU Impel on Apple, Impel on Apple said, the husband and wife team keep the pace moving. Fascinating stories and guests. Well worth the listen. Give them a try. Uh, it, it, it's, it keeps moving because Kristen keeps me moving. <laughs> that's true. I, she doesn't let me perseverate on anything that's... I get bored easily, so you got you to gotta keep a quick pace. Exactly, yeah. It's, it, I really appreciate that for, <laughs> for, for this podcast. Uh, we're also all full video episodes are up every week on my YouTube channel at D Glock and Flecken. We also have a Patreon with lots of cool perks, bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. Uh, come hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. Uh, we are there and we want to see you there. All right, come join us. Early ad free episode access, interactive QA live stream events, a lot more that we'll come up with as we go. Uh, patreon.com slash glockenflecken or go to glockenflecken.com speaking of patreon community perks shout out to all the jonathans out there patrick lucia c sharon s omar edward k abby h Stephen g rosk box jonathan f marion w mr granddaddy caitlin c brianna l dr j chaver w thank you all a virtual jonathan head nod to you all patreon roulette for the random emergency medicine tier patron uh, that we will give a shout out to now. Joyce O. Thank you, Joyce O. For I, I said that way too loud. <laughs> you yelled it. Uh, I'm sorry for everyone's uh, ears, but Joyce O, thank you for being a patron. And thank you all for listening. We are your host, Will and Kristen Flannery, aka the Glock and Fleckens. Special thanks to our guest today, Dr. Ricardo Nuila. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brooke. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omer Binsvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program disclaimer and ethics policy, ver submission verification licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockenflecken.com or reach out to us at human at, at, at knockknockhigh at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns. I tried to you I always say that word with utmost puns. disdain. I'm, I'm not a pun guy. <laughs> I'm, I don't do a lot of puns. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.